Uh, so without further ado, we'll get started with our first speaker, uh, Kozar Kwaja, uh, who comes from, uh, to us uh, from McGill University in Canada, and he's going to speak on the effects of pneumoperitoneum in sick patients. Thanks. Just put that there. Okay. Good. <clears throat> so I'd like to uh, thank uh, Sages and, and the chairs of this session for allowing me to, to speak. Okay, so I have no disclosures. At the, end of, at the end of the day, I think the major point here is that at 2 o'clock in the morning, when you have an ischemic bowel and you're taking the patient to the UR, you know, the, the bottom line is that we take a step, and we, a step for reflection, a moment to reflect and take a pause. And I want everyone to try to think about whether or not putting a scope in that patient is actually doing more harm than good. For the patient, and that's the bottom line. And, and as we, as we try to push the envelope with our minimally invasive approaches, and we bring something that we're very comfortable in our elect, in our elective practice, and we bring it at two o'clock in the morning, in a patient who's physiologically deranged, uh, we we have to take that moment to to reflect. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to talk about that, and uh, and and we'll go over the physiological impacts of uh, of pneumoperitoneum and how that can affect our patients, uh, our emergency general surgery patients. So let's just start uh, with the first case. So this is a 65-year-old or 66-year-old female who presents to the emergency room. Uh, she's post-op a laparoscopic sigmoidectomy uh, for adenocarcinoma, and she underwent the enhanced recovery program. She's had a stent before, and now she presents to the emergency room with, uh, with hypotension. And she has localized lower quadrant uh, pain. So this is your, your x-ray, and you see some free air uh, uh, below the diaphragm. And so the question really is this. Who would take this patient to the operating room and put a scope in? And we're, we're suspecting a, a, a potential leak. Uh, so who would put a scope in? OK. All right, so let's go to the next case. So now you have a 69-year-old male in the, in the ICU. Uh, he's post-op day one uh, from a mitral valve repair and a, and a cabbage uh, times two. He comes out with an intraaortic balloon pump. Uh, and, and these are the patients that we see at, at our center. And you get a consult that says, please rule out ischemic bowel. And the lactate's eight. And the patient's on significant pressors and is on inotropes and the cardiac index 2.2. And, and they do a CT scan, which is uh, inconclusive, and, and the lactate's still eight, and the patient's metabolic uh, has a derangement of, uh, of acidosis and a creatinine of 180. So who in this room would take this patient and, you know what, just put a small scope in? Because th th these are the cases that cardiac surgeons ask us at our hospital. Just put a scope in, take a look, and if it's ischemic bowel, you guys deal with it. Okay, so we have one person. Okay, so we're going to go through sort of the impacts of, of pneumoperitoneum uh, on physiology. And these are the three different types of people that we see. And I think the point is, is that they're not the same. So we're all comfortable with the healthy patient undergoing minimally invasive surgery. You know, that happens from 7.30 in the morning till 5.30 p.m. And then there's another class of patients who have comorbid illnesses who also go minimally invasive surgery. And these are patients who are sick, but you still put them on your elective practice. Uh, and you do your, your procedure. And let's not confuse this group with the patient who comes in acutely ill. Okay, so they're not the same population. The critically ill patient who needs surgery in the middle of the night has to be thought differently from, from these two uh, different groups. Okay, so one, one extreme is the elective hernia and the other extreme is strangulated hernia. Okay. So I think uh, to ensure that the minimally invasive procedures are performed safely in emergency patients, we need to understand, understand the physiological effects of laparoscopy and positioning of the patient. And we need to under, understand the physiology of the critically ill patient as well. Okay, so there's significant data describing alterations of physiology in elective healthy patients. And, and there's not really a lot of data uh, with the effects of pneumoperitoneum on acutely ill patients with respect to their derangement and physiology. Okay, so what are some of the cardiovascular response to pneumoperitoneum? And these are the things that I think we all learn, uh, I guess, during residency, uh, and, uh, and we may not actually sort of, we may not think about it in the middle of the night, but well, first of all, there's an increase in intra intra-abdominal pressure. 
patient position can actually affect preload and afterload. There's also the CO2 absorption. We'll talk about that a little bit later. There's a ventilatory strategy. There's intravascular volume. Um, there's also the pre-existing cardiovascular, uh, cardiopulmonary status of these patients. Those, these patients who, who come in with the ischemic bowel who have severe vascular disease do not have a normal cardiovascular system. And there's also the neurohormonal uh, response, and of course, they're, they're usually on tons of medication. Okay, so I, I know this is a busy slide, but the most important uh, line I wanted to show was the TE. So if you look at TE uh, images, during pneumoperitoneum, there's a, as you can see, there's an increase in the mean arterial pressure, there's an increase in SVR, there's an increase in CVP, and there is a decrease in cardiac output. So if you have a patient who is in severe septic shock going to the OR, already you have a derangement of their cardiac output from, from myocardial depression from sepsis. But if you're going to then on top of that add pneumoperitoneum, you will decrease their cardiac output. So what are the respiratory effects? Well, there's definitely, de definitely some effects of the CO2 gas that we use. Uh, there's a rate of absorption that's actually dependent on the gas solubility. Um, and what we find is that the peak uh, ETCO2, uh, end tidal CO2, and VCO2 are actually greater in the extraperitoneal insufflation versus the intraperitoneal uh, insufflation. And at the end of the day, the actual absorption of, PCO2, of, of CO2 really depends on the patient's cardiovascular pulmonary disease. How well are they able to uh, eliminate their, P, their, uh, their CO2? Um, and so we know that the minute ventilation increases on these patients, and we can actually have hypoxemia uh, that can occur due to hypoventilation or even intrapul intrapulmonary shunting, uh, and of course, from uh, reduced uh, uh, cardiac output. We know that there's a decrease in FRC and lung compliance, and, posi and patient positioning is a factor. So whether you put them in Trendelenburg or reverse Trendelenburg, this clearly affects not only lung mechanics, but also volume return and uh, afterload. So um, now, we know, we know that there are some positive effects of uh, pneumoperitoneum and laparoscopy in patients uh, compared to laparotomy. And, and these findings we find postoperatively, right? So there's a, there's a reduction, uh, there's a smaller reduction F in FRC, there's a better FEV1 uh, in patients uh, who undergo laparoscopy. And of course, there's early mobilization. Okay, this is, I think, an important uh, uh, table I think that we should always keep in, in the back of our uh, minds. These are the regional effects of pneumoperitoneum on the various organs. So in the brain, CO2 can increase uh, cerebral blood flow, right? It can also increase intracranial pressure. That's why um, a lot of us who do trauma, uh, you know, we think that this is an absolute inter uh, contraindication to doing a diagnostic laparoscopy in any patient who has a decreased mental status or you're suspecting uh, head injury. There's obvious effects to the liver. There is different, uh, there's a decrease in portal vein blood flow. There's a decrease in... Uh, uh, basically hepatic blood flow in, in general. And there's also an effect on uh, gastric uh, and small bowel perfusion. Now we do, we do laparoscopy routinely on colons and small bowel, but in the middle of the night, when you're dealing with someone who you're trying to solve ischemic bowel, or you're trying to address ischemic bowel, don't forget that your pneumoperitoneum is also altering the patient's uh, pH and is also altering the blood flow to, to the bowel. Of course, there's also uh, kidney derangements, as you can see there. And clearly, if you're going uh, to the OR uh, with someone who has an elevated creatinine, keep that in mind, that you're actually decreasing perfusion to the kidney during your time of uh, pneumoperitoneum. There's a number of uh, immunomodulators that have, been, uh, that have been found. And of course, I'm not going to get into the details uh, with that. And of course, there's a whole list of complications that uh, we all know um, with respect to uh, pneumoperitoneum um, in, in laparoscopy. So, um, so at the end of the day, I think we need to recognize the challenges in acute laparoscopy. The patients are sicker and they're critically ill. And they may be in shock, and that could be septic, hypovolemic, hemorrhagic. They may be cardiogenic. And someone that you're taking to the OR for severe sepsis, for some sort of a bowel ischemia, they also have, uh, they can have cardiogenic uh, 
effects uh, of, of that sepsis. Uh, and of course, there's the metabolic acidemia that's compounded by the lactate generation. So these patients who are acidotic from their sepsis, and now you've introduced PC, uh, CO2 into their, in their system, and if you cannot keep up with their minute ventilation, this can further uh, uh, aggravate their, their acidemia. And so this is your typical definition of shock. That's any in, in, impaired end organ perfusion. And so you have to sort of think about that when you're, when you're, doing, uh, when you're gonna take your patient and, and put the scope in. There are a number of comorbidities that are pronounced in critical illness, and of course diabetes and glucose control uh, is, is much more difficult than sepsis. There's, a, uh, there's acute on chronic renal failure syndrome. Um, there's uh, patients who have coronary arterial uh, disease uh, can further have uh, an increase in myocardial demand. So this is obviously, we always say this, just because you can do it, it doesn't mean that you should. And so in summary, I think these are the questions that we need to ask ourselves uh, when we take our emergency general surgery patients. What will the physiological impact be of, of the minimally invasive surgery? What are the potential benefits of laparoscopy in your patient? And what, and what are the, pa the, the potential complica uh, complications of pneumoperitoneum that your uh, patient can actually tolerate? So patients who show evidence of shock, hyperperfusion, or end organ dysfunction, uh, I would suggest should not undergo laparoscopy, and I think that should be the overall rule that we should be teaching our, our residents. Thank you.